All right, welcome to part two of my uh, Epe Grip videos. So I have made uh, some blanks. These are one centimeter gap, and these are six millimeter gap. So these are what I call mediums and larges. So I've made, uh, if you haven't watched the last video, I showed how to make how to make these things. So that one's, oh wow, good job. That one's a little bit off. That'll be all right. Uh, so I've made blanks. Uh, these are, I think, walnut, and these are poplar. Uh, doesn't really matter. So I've made some blanks, uh, and I'm going to make some grips out of these. So um, if you want to, uh, after the last video, I got a few communications uh, about various stuff. One person suggested that I glue these up and use a router. So I glue up uh, two layers of this and then use a router to make the channel. And... I, I thought about that, but that's, uh, you know, if you were going to automate these and make a ton of them, I still wouldn't do that. I would, I would cut them out with CNC, uh, with a CNC router, uh, that would give you sort of perfect cutouts. Uh, and that would be worthwhile, but I don't think that, I don't think that using a router to cut the channel, this is such a small part, you'd have to have a jig to hold the piece. And, uh, I think it's more trouble than it's worth. It only took me an hour or so to, to make these yesterday. So they've all come, there's all my clamps. They've all come out of their clamps, uh, but I'm gonna put carbon on these. So <clears throat> um, the process to put carbon on them. So first I have a spool of fairly heavy carbon toe. So toe is just string. So this is like a heavy carbon string. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this to lash the top and bottom of them to create sort of a carbon, um, hoop strength and, and a compression pad there on the top and bottom. And then <clears throat> this is what I have used in the past uh, to make a carbon grip. So this is a sock. It's a carbon sock and you can, you can open this up and slide the, uh, the, the piece inside and you put epoxy on it. And it's very nice. Uh, there's a new product that I'm interested in here. So this is a this is carbon Kevlar. So the yellow stuff is Kevlar, the black stuff is carbon. And somebody I know who knows a lot about this stuff thought that for this application, this might be better because the Kevlar makes things a little bit tougher. He was worried that with just one layer, one layer of carbon on this, that, um, that you could whack a handle or something or drop it or bang it around and you could, uh, you could damage the carbon sufficiently to, um, to, you know, impinge on the strength. I'm not sure about that, honestly. Um, I've made a bunch of these and I've never seen one damaged and then break or anything, but you know, I, I thought I would try it. Um, finally, those are, so there's a little bit of terminology in this. This is, this is what's called a 45-45 weave. And if you look at the end of this, I think you can see why. There's, there's a, um, a thread going this way at 45 degrees and a thread going this way at 45 degrees, right? And it produces kind of a finger puzzle kind of a design so that so that if you do actually stick your finger in this, let's see, and then you pull on it at all, it tightens down around your finger, right? Which is, which is a very nice design. Um, and this is what I have been using. I do have, I do have a heavier, um, so I had a few months ago, I had somebody ask me about like making a super heavy duty carbon grip because apparently they're a gorilla or something and they think they're going to break even a carbon grip. So this is the weight of this is called, this is 3K uh, and that's a measurement of how thick the, the carbon threads are. This is a much heavier duty grip. This is 12K and it's not 45, 45. If you look at this, you can see, I think, that the, that the carbon strands all go straight up and down. This is a zero degree sock. And the thing that holds it together is this elastic. So there are little tiny pieces of elastic that sort of hold it together and spring it. So if you try to spread it apart, it, uh, it has a kind of a springiness to it. Um, this, you know, will make a, a heavier coating. So uh, you could do that. <clears throat> um, honestly, I find that to be kind of overkill for an epee grip, but maybe I'll do it on one of them just to just to do it. Uh, okay, so the next thing to do is to shape these to the correct shape that I want, and then to prepare them for uh, for lashing some some carbon toe around the ends to make hoop strength and to make a kind of a compression pad. So let's do that. All right. So uh, I think on the last one, I 
Uh, I talked about using hand tools. I'm not going to use hand tools on this um, because I have six of them. Uh, it's very satisfying to use hand tools, but I think that uh, that that um, because I have a bunch of these to do, I'm just going to use that. I'm just going to use the belt sander. And of course, don't forget uh, to you know kind of measure what you're doing. If you just do this by eye, you can get quite off. So uh, so I'm going to try to get these things down to about 16. I hope you can see this. So like uh, 16 millimeters front and back, uh, maybe 16 in the back, 17 in the front. And then we'll work on the cross section, which has to taper a little bit, and then we'll do the corners. So, and if you're using power tools, Okay, so this is, I would say, roughly shaped. Um, uh, it's 17. Here, let's see if I can do this. Uh, it's about 
16 millimeters there. It's 16 and a half. And it's a little over 17, right at 17 uh, at the front end, which is fine. Uh, this way, it is a little too small. So, um, so this is about 13 millimeters, and, and that's a little too small, I think, but uh, that's not going to be a problem. I'm going to make some, some uh, a carbon end for it there, and we can shape that to the correct dimension when we get there. So, okay, so I have three grips ready to go. Uh, I'm going to taper these and put some epoxy on them. I'm also going to work on this one. This is the actually the grip I made in the last video, and I've been using it, um, and it was fine. It's worked great. I like the shape. Everything is good. But it cracked. It cracked right in the front, right there. And it didn't crack on a glue line, the wood cracked. So I have said several times, oh, you don't need the cap on the front or anything. So of course, having said that and put it on a video, uh, this immediately cracked. You could just sort of barely feel it when you were fencing with it. So I tightened it down and I, I would still, it didn't exactly creak, but it just felt like it had a little, I don't know, a little something, and sure enough, when I took it apart, it had a crack in it, right there. So, um, so I'm going to fix that. All right, so let's see, how do I do that? All right, so uh, I have the, I have the metal cap off the end of this, and uh, and I've cleaned the tape residue and stuff off of it just so I can inspect it and make sure it's okay. So I have taken a file and cleaned most of the. Um, of the polyurethane off of this. I'm going to finish that and then make a little indentation in the front end here. All right, so I've done the front end. Um, so this is this is a flat, very strong string that I've got. You can use thread to polyester thread, whatever you want. Um, and the idea is, I think that the first filming that I did of this was almost completely out of frame, so I'm going to try it again. So the idea is to soak this with uh, CA glue, put several lashings around, soak it again, several lashings, soak it again, several lashings, cut it off, and then sort of uh, coat it and, and wipe it down with a cloth to facilitate it holding on there. So let me move this stuff out of the way so I don't get it wet with glue. And let's see here. And I know that a lot of us have learned the lesson of not overusing CA when you're wiring a fencing weapon, but that doesn't really apply here. You want to use enough. Ah, you want to use enough glue so that you make sure that the string is soaked through. That's the that's kind of the goal here. This is a flat string, and I'm not particularly putting very much effort into keeping it flat as I as I deposit it on here, and you know, I don't think it matters. But maybe you think it matters, and if you think it matters, then you know, you can, you can pay attention to that. All right, there we go, a little bit more. So this is kind of a poor man's composite. What you're gonna see me do with the carbon here in a few minutes is a very similar idea to this, but with epoxy and carbon fiber, and that's, you know, what we might call a real composite, right? But this is, I mean, the idea of a composite is you have something very strong like the string and you have uh, a matrix, like in this case the CA, and the CA keeps the string where it's supposed to be, keeps it from twisting or fraying and protects it and so on, uh, but the strength is never in the epoxy and the strength here is not in the CA. It's it's in the fibers, and I don't know if you can tell here, but I'm wrapping this pretty tightly. All right, good. So we cut this. There we go. Of course, we're all familiar with CA, so it's setting up already and trying to grab my fingers because that's the nature of CA. Cut this off. Good. And then it's tempting to say you're done, but I think it's a good idea to put some more glue on it. And... Take a paper towel and rub it in and sort of fill the gaps and twist down the, the string into a very compact kind of an arrangement. All right, there you go. That is a poor man's composite end for the, for the front end. 
and also for the butt end. And I think that that's going to work at least as well as a metal cap will. Okay, so so much for the for the cheap and quick option. Uh, let's see what we can do with some carbon. All right, so the next thing is to taper the end of this. So I want to go down about one centimeter. I want to taper it all the way around, uh, and then I want to wrap carbon around it. So that should be pretty straightforward. Let's see here. So the next thing, um, you need a couple of washers and you need a couple of zip ties. So you run the zip tie through the washer, very good, and up through here, like this. You run the other zip tie through the washer and up through here like this. Okay. That, that, good. All right, so the goal is this, right? To have the zip tie in the washer coming out of each end. Okay, if the hole in the washer is big enough to allow the zip tie end to go through, you can stick a nail in the middle of there or something as a kind of a crossbar, but I think in this case, that is not a problem. Uh, good, so we turn this around so that it's facing the right way, and we make sure that the little crenellated portions are going through the right way. So I'm sure you guys know how zip ties work, so I'm not going to belabor that. There, good, turn this around, good, I think that's right, let's see, so when I push this through here, I should hear the happy little clicky sounds, right? There we go. Good. Disengaged. All right. Uh, I'll push this out this way. Uh, it's always something. Isn't it always something? It's always something. Right. Well. I have thoroughly messed this up, but you know, I might just leave it in just to show, you know, things don't have to go perfectly to work. All right, then through here, like this, and pull this tight. Just start by pulling it finger tight on one end, then pull it finger tight on the other end. Then you get to use your very fine finger fencing developed finger sense judgment. You want to pull this tight, but you don't want to break it. All right, that's the thing that you do not wish to do. And you want to pull this tight, but you don't want to break it. So you stretch it a little bit. And the goal is to have this pretty tight against here, and that could stand to be a little bit tighter. Mm, it's okay. it's okay. Oh, I see. We have a little tear out in the end here. Okay. So I'll fix that with super glue. All right. There we go. That's what we're aiming for. Okay. So I have my scale. Uh, I have a cup. I have gloves. So I'm a little sensitized to epoxy. So uh, when I went to a dermatologist about this several years ago, he sort of outlined what I should do if I wanted to keep using epoxy. Uh, and one of the things that he sort of threw in there was that what he was telling me to do is what everybody should do, but that hobbyists don't really pay attention to safety. So, you know, I think that's a fair point. I really do. So, um, so maybe pay a little bit more attention to safety. So I use this two to one uh, laminating epoxy. Uh, one to one, sorry, one to one laminating epoxy. 
um, which is, I think, a little bit less sensitizing than the two to the one or five to one that most boat builders use. Um, I, I mostly, for most of my boat building career, I use a two to one or a five to one. Um, and I learned a few tricks, so, so here are some tricks. Uh, use a scale, don't use the pumps. The pumps suck. The pumps are terrible because they'll get clogged up and give you a bad mix. Uh, one to one by volume does not mean one to one by weight. So this particular epoxy is 100 to 84 by weight, 100 resin uh, to 84 uh, resin uh, uh, hardener. And so I just used Excel and made a little sheet here so I can dollop out the amount of resin that I need and then I can see what weight I should go up to with the epoxy or uh, with the hardener. And that just makes things easier for me. Um, touching on safety again, use decent gloves. Don't use those super, super thin gloves. For God's sake, don't handle epoxy without gloves. It makes me crazy when I see people on YouTube just happily dabbing their fingers into epoxy because, you know, if you keep doing that for 10 years, you're going to end up with big rashes on your fingers and your feet and on the inside of your arms. It's bad stuff. So minimize your exposure to epoxy as much as possible. Uh, the last thing, the two last things, are mix it super well. That's, a, that's a, a mistake that most amateur epoxy people make. They don't mix well enough. And let it really cure before you mess with it. Don't mess it with it when it's green. Definitely don't sand it when it's green. Um, wear a respirator when you're sanding it. Um, and, and, and make sure that it's really cured. But right now, what we have to worry about is making sure that it's mixed well enough. So let's see, I'm going to take my lids off here. And then I thought I had a mixing stick. All right. Good. So how much epoxy do I need? And it's just kind of a just kind of a go by feel kind of thing. I think I need like this much. So let's see, just put in the amount of resin that you think is appropriate to your job. I think that's good. I think I'm dripping all over. Uh, I've already cut the toe, the carbon toe, and I have it in, you need, so to wrap up with 12K carbon, to wrap up an end like one of these, you need about maybe a meter of 12K carbon toe. So um, I've already cut that, and then, kind of importantly, I've put all my carbon away because when your hands are wet with epoxy, if you pick up your carbon or you pick up, you know, a sock or something, you've ruined it. You've got you've got epoxy on it, and it's never gonna it's never gonna work correctly again. All right, so I have put in 31, 31 uh, grams of of resin. Boy, that seems like enough. All right, I'm gonna go with that. So. 30 gives me 55.2, so I'm going to go to like 56, something like that. So here we go. So I just watch the readout, and I want to hit on 56 as closely as possible. Here we go, 47. This is too much. I'm not used to mixing up one to one. There we go, 55.69. A little bit more. When you get to, there we go, that's perfect. When you get down to like fractions of a gram in a mix like this, it's not gonna mess you up. And you know, if I just went one-to-one -one by weight, according to the manufacturer, I would be fine. But you know, it's not right. It's 15% off or so, so uh, so I try to do it as accurately as I can. But having said that, you know, if you're a tiny, tiny bit off, don't worry about it. Don't use...
go. Arc. On. Go like this. 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 This is why you need gloves, huh? There we go. There we go. There we go. You can see the epoxy oozing out of the cracks. I don't know if you can see it, but I can see it. There we go. Excellent. I'm halfway done. All right, so it is the next day. Um, I have dumped these... Wow. I have dumped these in my... Um, in the bed of my truck for a day and I just let them bake in a hundred degree sun and I have discovered you always discover something I have discovered that this epoxy sticks to Ziploc bags so maybe all epoxy would stick to a Ziploc bag who knows I did not really anticipate that so these are a little bit harder than they might be to unwrap but it's still fine and honestly unwrapping stuff that you have epoxied is one of life's little known pleasures in my opinion. So alright, we'll get you out in a minute. Let's try this out. Oh, oh that's not good. Alright, so we got a bunch of wrapped up um, uh, carbon. You have to be really careful with this. It's got a ton of sharp little edges on it. So I go around and like try to trim those things off. You don't want anything poking at you as you try to get this thing unwrapped, obviously. So we have a loose end here, which is a blessing. So you just have to kind of work your way through this here. All right, so I have unwrapped all three of these. Um, so this is what they look like when they come out of the wrapping. This one still actually has the little zip ties to it. And this one does. This one I have cleaned up a little bit. I forgot to record it. Sorry. Uh, so this one still has some plastic on it that I need to grind off. But I have sort of smoothed the ends down and kind of cleaned it up a little bit. But this is about perfect, I think. So if I get my little measuring tool here. Yeah, this is like uh, 17 millimeters, something like that. I think that's pretty good. This was exactly the same size as the pommel, and it was 17 and a half millimeters, right? So that's perfectly fine. So a pommel's gonna fit right up against that, and then, um, and then we can put a couple of washers in and it'll sit fine. So we have a big compression pad here. You can see I've used the grinder and kind of uh, flattened the end out. So we've got a big carbon compression pad right here. We've got a ton of hoop strength up here, much more than we need, but you know, uh, why not? If I was doing it anyway, why not? So uh, I've shaped this a little bit. So the question now is, do I want to keep it sort of square or do I want to round it? And uh, in the past, I have, I have rounded these things a little bit in the back. I think for this series, I want all three of these to be the same. And I think for this series, I'm going to, I think I'm going to leave it square. I'm going to leave it more square in the back here so that you have a better pad for your thumb if you'd like to hold it like this. And you have a better pad on the side for your thumb if you'd like to hold it like this. If you're half gripping and you're up here, you've got this big flat space that sits against your hand that I think will help with stability here. If you like to hold it like that, again, you know, you just don't want to... The bad thing is if somebody likes to put their thumb right here where I've got a corner. But from what I can see, most people are either holding it like this, right, with the... With the um, uh, the forefinger forward, right? This is what I call the Genet grip. For so this Genet, hold this epee like this, or like this, right? Um, which I think of as the standard grip, but maybe it's not. Who knows? So, should I take this corner off? Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. All right, let's we'll see. All right, so let's start shaping one of these things.
good. Um, you get the general shape like that, then uh, this is a mess. Then you can work your way down hand very effectively. So I'm doing two things here. I'm getting all the shiny spots off. I'm roughly shaping it. Uh, three things. And I'm making sure that I don't feel a bump when I do that because we don't want any serious concavity there. Both for the shape of the grip when you're fencing with it, but also because we have to put a carbon wrap on this and it's not going to can work very well if you have serious concavity. Um, if you are a person who has worked with composites before, you may be firing up your keypad to tell me that I'm grinding into the carbon. And you are correct. And generally speaking, if you're working with high-end composites, you don't grind into the carbon, right? You, you put some kind of a, a fog coat over it or something where you fill it, right? You, you don't grind into fibers in general, if you can help it. Uh, the thing here is, though, this is so overbuilt. This is so massively overbuilt uh, for, for the purpose here that it's fine to take a little bit of the carbon away um, in the interest of just getting a smooth finish. That is perfectly okay. All right, so Run your finger along it. It's okay for it to have a little bit of a bump to it, but any sharp ridges like this are going to leave a chance for a little gap under under the sock, and we don't want that. All right, when you're happy with that, the belt sander and this little rasp tool that I have made will leave too coarse to finish for epoxying, so take it down. This is 60 grit. 60 grit is fine. Alright, so man, that feels pretty nice to me. It really does. It feels like a nice grip. Alright, and it feels very much like this one. Oh, it's a little bit longer. Look at that. Some of that, so here, if I if I line up the front here, you can see that the back is a little bit off. We can make up some of that with washers. So if you stick a couple of washers uh, on there, or a slightly different pommel. Um, I'm kind of reluctant to grind the longer one down to match the shorter one. I suppose I should, but I'm reluctant to do so. Hmm. Yeah, it's a little longer than that, too. All right. All right, good. One more to go. Okay, so I have three grips. They're all shaped as close to identically as I can get them. It's still a little rough. Missed a little spot there. All right, so the last thing to do is to glue the carbon cover on and wrap it. So, so good. Get the dust off those. Sure, the gloves from yesterday. The epoxy doesn't really stick to these things very well, but you know, just make sure they don't have any holes in them or anything from sticking to their own fingers. All right, that's good. Now this, 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 this. Brush. Okay, so uh, we need electrical tape. This time I'll try not to glue it to the plastic and ruin the rest of it. So 
the goal here is to cut off more or less, I'm going to use this Kevlar carbon stuff because I find it fascinating. Uh, so you cut off enough so that you can, you know, fit it with maybe a centimeter to spare on either end, something like that. So Kevlar is, of course, notoriously difficult to cut with scissors. They sell special scissors for it. Or you can use ancient, high-quality sewing scissors, one or the other. But cheap modern scissors don't cut it. All right, so now we slide this in here. Go. Go. A little slack on one end, a little slack on the other end. And it is by far better to make this a little too long, obviously, than it is to make it a little too short. All right, there we go. And I think one layer of this stuff is fine, more than enough. But if you want to double layer it, you know, it's your money. Uh, it won't add very much weight, but it won't measurably increase any important parameter like strength or anything either. This is going to be more than strong enough. Okay, that's two. And... Oh, that's three. All right. And as we said last time, put your carbon away before you start mixing epoxy, right? Put it away, close the lid, get it away from you. Get some of this loose. There we go. There we go. There we go. All right. So the plan here is to wet these out by just brushing them. Wet this out, then slide it on, and then wrap it with... Uh, with with the electrical tape. All right, so onward. Last time I mixed up 30 grams, which was too much. 30 grams of um, resin, and then the associated correct amount of hardener. So that was too much. It was too much for what we were doing, but it might be might be about the right amount now. So 30 grams goes to 55 grams. So something something like this. Let's see. Tear. Okay. Go. I don't know if you guys can see the scale. Can you see the scale? I don't know if seeing the scale is very interesting. Anyway. Here we go. So I need 30. A little over 30. That does not seem like enough to me, but my instincts are honed for two to one epoxy, not one to one epoxy. So, you know, we'll see. All right, so 55, if I hit hit right on 30, I hit 32, so 57. We want to go to 57. Okay. Fifty-six point six, close enough. Doing it this way with the scale is so much better than any other method that I am shocked that anybody does anything else. All right, next, mix, lots of mix, 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 mix. Mix, mix, mix. Uh, la, 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 la. So the the FIE has reversed their decision about uh, Olga Carlin, or at least they have they have given her a slot in the Olympics. I guess that was the IOC. Anyway, that whole thing, that whole thing, man. Crazy. Crazy. There's something on fencing.net this or not on uh, our fencing about this morning about uh, how apparently the Russians were dictating what the punishment would be or what the resolution would be sort of in real time at the fencing venue. Which I just find kind of remarkable. You know, 
high level amateur athletics is weird. Really weird. Super small amounts of money and yet super high amounts of international prestige and influence and have you. I don't know. It's just weird, man. All right, that seems good to me. I hope that's enough. All right, so here we go. Here we go. There's no need to be super tidy about this. Just get the stuff on now. Go. Do this first. That's one. And then I'm going to get epoxy on my stick. That's two. Okay, so let those soak for a minute. Then get these things. There. 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 I think this can seem super technical if you're watching it on YouTube, you know? I've watched some people do composites on YouTube and been sort of impressed despite myself. It seems super high tech. But the guy that I learned most of this from was a boat builder who would describe it as stinky paper mache, which I think is a very just and equitable description. It is about as hard as paper mache. I think I've mixed up too much again. I just am not good at estimating amounts with this one to one epoxy. I just make too much. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, so perhaps the hardest part of this is with your gloves on to sort of work the end of this open. Sometimes you need a little tool or something. So here. here we go. Here we go. Good. Get it started, and then look it a little bit loose, and get it on there, no hurrying, not in a hurry, never in a hurry, there we go, good, 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 good. If you just left it like this, it would probably be fine. I'm going to wrap it, but honestly, if you just left it like this, just because of the construction of it, it would probably be fine. Maybe I'll just leave them like that. Who can say? All right, that's one. So I just broke this open a little bit. Try to get this one's on too much. Try to get about the same amount on each end just so you don't accidentally uh, run short or something. Oh, good, that's number two. Bum, 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 bum,
on, on, on. There we go. Good. So you could leave it like this. If you leave it like this and just leave it sitting on a table like this, uh, I'm afraid that you're going to get a big puddle at the bottom of hard plastic, and then you're going to have to try to get that off somehow, and you're likely to mess up the carbon when you do that. So uh, you would have to come up with some way to like hang them or something, which I did not do beforehand, so I'm not going to change plants here. I am going to put some excess epoxy on this so that I make sure that I don't have any blue starved fibers or resin starved fibers here. There we go. There we go. Okay. And I made too much again. Crazy. Alright. Finally. Finally. Take one of them. Gently. Gently wrap tape. Just get it started. There we go. Not too hard. Just really just the tension that you need to pull the tape off the roll is enough. Might be more than enough. There we go. Good. Ah. So the ends are a little bit tricky. You have to build them up, cut back a little, and go forward a little, and cut back a little, and go forward a little. It really is kind of tricky. All right, that's, that's going to have to be good enough. All right, now, this way, let's get back to the other end. And you get the idea. Go. And once again, don't fold that under. So you don't want to make a big wrinkle. That's not the plan. Okay. Get to the end. Don't be too ambitious. If you go off the end, it'll just slide on you. Put a couple of wraps. Try again. A couple of wraps. Ah. A couple of wraps. I think that's going to have to be good. All right. So here we go. There we go. All right. And then just leave that and do the next one. The only tricky part on these really is the ends, and, you know, they're not super critical, just if you want a nice, clean-looking wrap, you have to be kind of careful not to buckle them under or anything. There, there, that's going to do for that. So, there we go. So I'm doing this because I get, you know, a few emails a year inquiring as to whether I'm still making grips or if I'll make someone a grip or whatever. And I mostly make these for my students and myself and a few people I know. And I don't really want to go into the grip manufacturing business. But on the other hand, it is a nice way to make grips, in my opinion. And somebody might as well be doing it. So. Here you go. Um, some improvements that you could make if you have a different skill set than I do. I think the primary improvement would be cutting out the pieces with the CNC router. I don't think a number of people have talked to me about 3D printing. And the thing is that 
uh, the, the core material here, the wood, is loaded entirely in compression when you tighten it down and when you fence with it. Not entirely, but, but almost entirely. Ah, yeah. Okay. Um, almost entirely in compression. And most of the plastics that you can 3D print are not very good in compression. So even if you put carbon over them, the compression would kill you. The grip would be coming loose all the time. I might ought to draw some pictures of this to explain what I mean, but the grip would be coming loose all the time and uh, it wouldn't work very well. So maybe if you know more about it than I do, you can make it work, but, um, but I think that you need something that's at least as good as wood in compression. And I think that's hard to do with a 3D printer. But, you know, whenever I say that, 3D printing people say, well, actually, you know, um, they say that, but they never show me anything that has sufficient compression strength to act as a decent core for something like this. So, God bless it. No, no, I'm being too ambitious. There, there. much epoxy on the tape. I'm just determined to get a nice tight sort of a end on this to make it wrap around nicely. There we go. Ah, I hate you. All right. That'll do. That'll do. All right. There we go. There we go. There we go. Uh, good, good. If you've gotten your tape all completely covered with epoxy, it's worth two minutes and a rag to clean it off on the edges. If you just wipe it clean, you know, you'll lose the top row and that's all. If you leave big globs of epoxy on the sides of it, you lose the whole thing. So there you go. Uh, once again, wipe your hands off. Good, good, good. Hold the glove off. So I've used these twice now. If I'm teaching you epoxy tricks, I've used these twice now with my hands. Um, and so the next time I use them, I would wash them. I would, um, I will wash them. I will take them outside and hose out the interior because they get pretty stinky and sweaty. And if you just leave them sitting on the bench, um, they can they can get nasty, smelly, make your hands smell bad. All right, good. That's it. What comes next? All right, welcome back. So this has been sitting out baking in the sun for an afternoon. So let's see what we've got. You can see that this, that the epoxy doesn't stick to saran wrap at all, which is what I was anticipating, honestly, from the um, from the uh, uh, Ziploc. But I guess, you know, live and learn. So here we go. We get some of this free here. This, this, this. Don't cut towards your fingers. There. There's a good rule. Write that down. Okay. So just get an end free, and the rest of it will come pretty easily, I think. go. Don't pull hard at tape when you have a razor sharp exacto knife in your hand. Another good rule for life. There we go. Ay, ay, ay. It's not a good idea at this juncture to start cutting this like just cut along here, that would be a bad idea because you can cut into the carbon pretty easily and you know, we don't want to do that. So just work this around. This does obviously produce some waste in the form of tape, but compared to vacuum bagging, this is, this is a minuscule, minuscule amount of waste. And so if you're kind of looking into this, 
and you run across the idea of vacuum bagging and you think, well, I'll just do it with vacuum bagging. I mean, first of all, vacuum bagging is a whole another layer of setup. That's the first thing. But the second thing to me, <clears throat> the thing that bugs me, is just the sheer amount of trash. Oh, that's nice. The sheer amount of trash it produces. It's just unsupportable. And this is just as good. It's just uh, a little bit of a hassle to get it done here. There we go. There we go. Tape keeps breaking. not cut towards the carbon. Just don't do it. No matter how feathery you think your touch is, you're going to end up with a big score along the length of the carbon, which, since this is so brutally over-designed, um, probably wouldn't have any effect, but it looks awful. just looks awful. So you can see this is coming out nicely. Pretty happy with this. Ay ay ay. So I think that this um, one to one epoxy that I'm using is a little bit rubberier in its final state than two to one because if I do this with two to one, it just kind of flakes off and. The whole thing comes unwrapped in a very satisfying way, and this is kind of rubbery, a little bit resilient, which is not terrible. I think it's still very strong. I just, it's not quite as satisfying to unwrap, I guess. Not the most important thing in the world. Okay, there we go. Is this interesting? I don't know if this is interesting, but whenever I'm showing somebody how to do something and I skip a step, they, just because I think it's not interesting to watch, they inevitably tell me, why didn't you show me how to do that? So, you know, I'm showing you how to peel the tape off. The way to do that is, you peel the tape off. And you can see here the benefit of the tape not being the same color as carbon here, or the carbon Kevlar that we are using. Okay. There we go. Don't cut towards yourself and don't cut towards the carbon. There we go. All right. That looks pretty good to me. It's a little bit sticky from the tape. I'm going to wash it down and trim the ends, and we'll see what we have ended up with. All right. So I have three of these unwrapped. Uh, the next thing, we still have these hard tails. So the wrap looks really good. This is really hard. Uh, everything adhered really well. There's no bubbles or anything. Uh, really, wrapping it with with tape is a great sort of a kludge if you don't want to uh, if you don't want to actually vacuum bag something. So I'm going to cut these tails off with my little cheap saw here. I'm going to use a good saw. There we go. Okay, so it is very easy uh, here to cut a little too close and cut into the wood. So error on the side of caution here and 
cut a little bit away. You're just trying to save a little grinding. You don't need to be cute about it. holding it by hand, but I don't like to clamp these, you know, I don't want to crush the, the, um, the laminate or anything. All right. All right, and now we switch over to the trusty grinder. Go. There you. Good. And... This is an issue with Kevlar. Um, I haven't used Kevlar a ton, so this is an issue with Kevlar uh, that I've not had to address before. When you grind it, it fuzzes up. So I'm going to try to cut it with the X-Acto knife and see how that goes. So uh, we have all of these trimmed. This one is actually done, and these two need to be sort of finalized, I guess is the term. So um, the first thing I do is make sure that the ends are clear enough. I take a quarter inch bit and just, you don't have to go very far, but you might have gotten some little epoxy boogers, you know, as soon as you feel it touching the wall on the inside print. So go to the other side. There we go. All right, now um, we have a choice. So this is a quarter inch hole. Uh, the tang, hang on. The tang of an epe has a block here, which is bigger than a quarter of an inch. Uh, this is a quarter of an inch, right? The shaft is a quarter of an inch, and this has some little corners on it, uh, which, which makes it larger. Now I'm kind of curious, like, what that is. But anyway, it's a little bit bigger than a quarter of an inch. Let's see. So this is, uh, huh, this is a little smaller than a quarter of an inch. This is 5.5 millimeters. The diameter here, the corner to corner, is 8 millimeters, right? So you could over drill the first, you know, what, uh, three centimeters or so of this to eight millimeters, right? So this is five eighths, which is eight millimeters, right? So if you wanted to, you can over drill this with, um, uh, with a three eighths or with a five sixteenths. This is five sixteenths with a five sixteenths bit. 
I don't like to do that, but what I do like to do makes a lot of people nervous. So if you want to just over drill the first three centimeters, you know, that's okay. Um, what I do is knock this on to an old Epe tank. So first you want to match the curvature as closely as you possibly can, right? And then put this in a vise. Let's see here. Can you see my vise? Where's my vise? There it is. Yes. All right. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So put this in a vise like this. Good. Take this one. Good. Put this here. Good. And then. So I've cut this to the correct length so that it is just flush here and resting against the bench down on the bottom, which is more or less what I want. Then you have a sacrificial block of wood. And very importantly, you want to make sure this is on straight, right? And this one is not exactly straight. So yeah, I've just bent this to the correct curvature, but I've messed up straightness of it. So when I sight down this, this should be perfectly straight. I would take the camera off there, but it's a pain in the neck to get back on the mount, so you just have to take my word for it. Sight down here and make sure this is perfectly straight before you try to put it on. Then you take this. So an important thing is that you want the little square here to be parallel to the flat top of the grip, right? So put it on. Good. There we go. Good. Okay. So now when I look at this, the flat top of the grip should be perfectly parallel to the blade here, which it is. Uh, and then you can take a sacrificial piece of wood of some sort. People hate it when I do this. They just hate it. And if you don't want to do it, you can just over drill. So the reason I have to knock this on is because I'm actually hammering that little square piece into a hole that's a little too small for it. And you think, why did I do that? Well, you know, it makes it fit better. All right, so here we go. I've drilled a, a 5 16 hole there, so it has, the tang has somewhere to go. There we go. Okay. So, good. So let's see, this is now hammered on, right? So this is this is fitted to an FA tank. And it's super tight, right? Which is what we want. We want it to be super tight. You want it to fit. I mean, you don't want to just be able to slide this on there and slide it off. That's convenient for assembling, but it, it makes for a looser feeling FA and it means you have to tighten the pommel down more and it's just a pain in the neck all the way around. All right, then how do you get this off? Put this here. You need a vise for this, obviously. Crank this down, ah, pretty tight. Take a big pair of pliers, put them here. Hold with your hand and If you put this on through, so there you go, perfectly square hole. It's a little bit off center. On this end, on the bell guard end, that doesn't matter very much. On this end, this does matter, and I have missed down here. So the other ones are pretty good, but this one, I can trim this a little so you can see it. This one, I probably would not sell to somebody. I would use it in my club as a club at bay, but you can see that the hole has ended up somehow off center down here and so the pommel is going to be a little off it's going to take some tape to even that out I wouldn't sell this to somebody all right good let's see the last one so you can see this one is very nicely centered and this is what you want right and this is what I usually get I don't know how I screwed that one up um, all right good so the last thing to do I think these others are already done the last thing to do on this is to uh, to just touch the edges of this with with CA with super glue to take care of any of the frizziness or anything because you don't want that coming unraveled or feeling loose or anything 
And then I'm going to dip these in polyurethane. Oh, and I have to cut the little channel. In fact, let's do that now. All right, so we're going to use one of these little Dremel cutters here. To cut. To cut a little channel here. All right, so... Make sure you're on the right end, um, and make sure the right side is up. So I want to cut a little channel like this, right? I'm going to try to kind of do this in midair so you can see what I'm doing. Alright, pretty good. So I've cut a little channel, came out kind of square. I have a nice little rat tail file here that I use to kind of clean these up and round the corners. Once again, you're getting this, this frizzing behavior. So a lot of the time in boat building, people say to use Kevlar if you're going to use it under a layer of fiberglass. And I think this is why, because every time we trim or cut this or anything, we're ending up with these little frizzy layers. It is not good here. Let's see if this works. Oh, look at that. That looks pretty good. Let's try it down here. Fire. Fire, good. Here we go. Alright. Uh, so, we have, a little, we have a little channel cut there. I think that that has worked fine. Alright, finally, uh, I'm going to try to put some polyurethane on these and let them dry and they will be finished. Uh, so the nice thing about this is if you if you have an old can, like I've got an old can of gloss polyurethane that I will never use because I don't really like gloss polyurethane. So uh, it would probably sit there forever. But for this application, it literally doesn't matter because no one's ever going to see it. It's going to be wrapped up and, you know, so it doesn't matter if it's shiny or satin or whatever. It doesn't matter if the polyurethane is old or dirty. It has a big skin on it like this. See, I would never use this for like a furniture project because it's got, well, maybe I would, I don't know. Probably not because I don't like satin polyurethane. It's got a big skin on it here. So let me get rid of this. There go. And if I wanted to be delicate about it, I would probably, um, I would probably thin this, but I'm not gonna bother. So, maybe put on a glove so I don't get my hands all sticky. And I don't even think I need a brush. I'm going to dip this. Oh, you can't see what I'm doing. I'm going to dip this in here and flip it around and dip it the other way. And the reason I'm doing this largely is because I want the polyurethane to get inside the channel because I want to seal up inside the channel, right? So I dip it a couple of times, I make sure that it gets completely wet, and that's good enough. I wipe the, the grips down with, um, with uh, acetone before I did this. There we go, good, there we go, good. And now I've got polyurethane all over the rim here, which you're not supposed to do. Alright. Excellent. Excellent. Alright. Good. So, uh, I have this set up vertically like this, but I actually think I'm going to tilt it so that it can drip out a little bit, because we do want like as much of the excess to drip out as we can here. In fact, if you wipe these off on the rag, I wouldn't blame you too much. Let's see, here, here, here. I'm not really worried about the outside. I wanted to make sure I got some on the inside. This one around a little bit. 
go two. And finally, number three. All right. So let them dry and uh, you're done. Go install them. Okay, so final comments. Um, it is a little bit of a process. I like working on composites, so, you know, I don't worry about it too much, but it is kind of a process. Uh, and and that is why... I'm taking my glove off. Hang on. Just a moment. That is why I said way back at the beginning of this that this is a good idea. This is what I call the dorm room epe grip, right? Just a wooden epe grip, as long as the dimensions are big enough, right? So this is a quarter of an inch, which is, what, six and a half millimeters or something. You want this to be, I think, at least 16, right? This, let me see. Yes. There. You want this to be at least 16 in every dimension, right? So there we go. There we go. As long as it's like 16 millimeters in every dimension and it's just got a, a quarter inch, I know I'm mixing units, a quarter inch channel in it. I don't think you're going to break it just by fencing with it. I really don't. And these are easy to make. These are easy and fast. Um, I do think that putting some kind of hoop strength on the front and back is a good idea. I think when you make something like this, honestly, this is going to last as long as a pre or wooden grip is going to last. So if you want to, you can put a rubber channel on this. In fact, in fact, hold on. Okay, so I have cut a piece of the rubber and put it on the dorm room grip. Those were little quote marks, dorm room grip. Um, the trick to do that, I would have filmed it, but it was in the kitchen. The trick to do that is to rub some dish soap on this and then slide this on and then wash it all off with water. And, uh, and that gets rid of the excess dish soap. So let's see now. I cut it a little over long here. So I'll just trim this. Get it close at first and then just you know, just kind of, there we go, that seems pretty good. You don't need to make a notch, the wires don't need to see the notch, they just need to not get crushed. So there we go, there we go, okay, so there we go, that is, in my opinion, a pretty good simulation of a pre -air grip, and it was really easy to make. So these things, while they are super neat and everything, um, are considerably more trouble. So if you like working with composites or you want to learn to work with composites, you know, be my guest. But if you just want, you know, to make a, a, a grip that is like the pre -air grip, but that is maybe a different shape or something, right? This is this is much more square in the back here, and so when I hold it like this, I feel more secure with this grip than I do with the Prior. So I like this a little bit better. Um, okay, so here endeth the lesson, except except for one thing. Um, I've been yelling a fair amount of the time, and I'm sorry about that. And the reason is, though, that I wear these things. I actually wear um, earplugs under these, right? Because I'm using loud equipment, and I don't want to damage my hearing. And most of the time, whether I'm grinding or something or not, I'm wearing safety glasses. And whenever I'm handling epoxy, I'm, I'm wearing gloves. And the lesson here is really, I hate these YouTube channels that are kind of cavalier with safety, so I don't want to be cavalier with safety. Um, so, you know, be a little bit careful, right? Take care of your ears, take care of your eyes, don't expose yourself to toxic chemicals that you don't need to, okay? I would hate to, to tell somebody how to do this and they go out and they build a couple of epi grips out of epoxy and then they sensitize themselves to epoxy. I think that would be the worst possible result. Okay, good. Uh, I hope this was useful. And if you have any questions about how to do this or, or um, about how any of it works or anything, you know, get in touch. Otherwise, have a nice time. Okay, I think we're done. So uh, I have set these in the bed of my truck in the baking sun for about four hours. And I think they're finished. Nice hard finish. Polyurethane looks good. Uh, that's what the end should look like. I got a little, little drip there, but it's not bad. Um, and this is the front. It's got a little notch. I think that the weave looks super cool. You're not going to be able to see it when you're actually fencing with it, but you know, it looks nice. Very light, brutally strong. 
if you look at the end there, you can see the carbon ring, right? That black ring around there is solid carbon. So I do not think we'll have any trouble with compression or hoop strength or anything. And more importantly, on the other end, that whole thing is solid carbon there. So I don't think we'll have any trouble with that. That little lip is just a little piece that's sticking up. That's not going to cause any trouble. Um, good. They're very light, but perhaps we can quantify that. So here's my little scale. A gram scale is a very worthwhile purchase if you're doing stuff like this. Let's see. 26 grams. So, I mean, that's a lot of weight saving over an aluminum grip. And this is, I think, every bit as stiff and as uncompressible as an aluminum grip. And, okay, maybe not quite as uncompressible because lengthwise, you know, when you're, when you're pushing down on it, the wood itself will compress a little bit, but, but 95%. This is what I call the dorm grip, right? This is the one that I wrapped with, uh, with string and super glue. And so it's just made out of wood. I put, uh, I put some surgical tubing on it so that it is like the, uh, the prior grip. And let's see, this one is 39 grams. Actually, so this isn't quite fair. I should put this and then this on there, and then I can't see it. So 34, 34 if you put, because I'm going to put a wrap around this, right? And that weighs something. So 34, so they weigh about the same. Uh, both of them are, are a ton lighter than, uh, than an aluminum grip is. And this one, I think, this one is super comparable to a Prior. It's not really a copy of a Prior. The shape is not the same. So uh, this is the front and this is up. So you can see here, just from the shine on it, right, it has a very distinct corner all the way back here. So it has more shape in the back so that you have, in my opinion, more grip in the back. But, you know, that's just me. Uh, but you can make these, you know, however you want. This is a straighter one, right? This was, I think, what I called my minimum grip. Um, so that's like a two millimeter bend. So if I put that here and I film here, I'm saying that this little gap here, let's see if I can actually get a picture of it. This little gap right here is about, that doesn't help at all, does it? Is about uh, two millimeters. Um, this one was the max grip. So that gap is one centimeter. Um, and I've still got some six, six millimeter grips in the garage to finish. All right, so anyway, that's the whole project. These will probably get this golf grip tape on them, this heat shrink stuff. I think that's a very nice covering. And uh, I'll give them to somebody in my club or I'll put them on a club FA or something. Anyway, if you have any questions, give me a yell. Bye.